Uh, tonight, it's Mike Williams. Mike has been teaching social studies and English at the Miami Valley Career Technology Center for the past 35 plus years. He uh, earned bachelor's and master's degree in history at the University of Dayton and has been an adjunct history instructor at the University of Dayton and Sinclair Community College. Mike has had history articles published in American History, the uh, Ohio History Timeline, World War II History, the Ohio History Echoes, and the Online History News Network. In addition, he's written a nonfiction reader for middle school students and co-authored a book, The Industrial Hobarts. Thank you for inviting me here. Enjoy the opportunity to, to share uh, what was a, an interesting summer to a research with you about uh, uh, a guy that probably you've never heard of by the name of Ernest Cunio, uh, which I'm labeling uh, FDR's Confidential Crusader. And uh, here's a photo of him. Uh, Cunio was about uh, six foot tall, weighed over 200 pounds, not an easy guy to overlook, yet the fact that history did overlook him kind of proves how well he did his job. Uh, he liked to work behind the scenes. As, uh, as he said more than once, um, I, I kind of like to stay out of sight. Uh, anonymity is freedom. And uh, Cunio grew up, uh, was born in uh, uh, Karlstadt, New Jersey, uh, went to East Rutherford High School where he was, no big surprise, a football star. Uh, he certainly looked more like a football player than a member of FDR's brain trust, so you could say he was maybe the brawniest member of the, the brain trust. And he went to college at, uh, uh, at Penn State, uh, but for something I, I don't exactly know what happened, for some kind of infraction, he was booted off of Penn State's football team early in his career. So he went from, of all places, from there to Columbia in the Ivy League. And he was a football player during his uh, yeah, years at Columbia and actually won uh, All-American honors as a uh, left guard for the, uh, for the offense. And uh, during the time he was there, he, he also spent his summers writing for uh, a newspaper in, in New York. And, uh, uh, a guy named Lowell Olympus was kind of his uh, uh, mentor, if you will. And uh, at the same time, though, he was going to law school. And so after he graduated, he actually uh, played two years in the NFL. Um, first year he played for the Orange Tornadoes, playing out of Orange, New Jersey. And the following year, uh, they moved to Brooklyn and were known as the Brooklyn Dodgers. The early NFL teams moved around a lot, changed their names a lot. Now, if you want a local connection, here's the local connection. Once upon a time, the Orange Tornadoes were the Dayton Triangles. That begins and ends the local connection <laughs> of the whole story. Um, but uh, as, and as I said, he was a uh, uh, so he played, played for the NFL in the fall. He, he did get his law degree, became a lawyer. Uh, and like I said, he wrote for a newspaper in the summer for the uh, New York Daily News, where uh, this guy, Lowell Olympus, was his, his, uh, his mentor. Uh, this is Lowell Olympus's obituary. He wanted to write it himself, so he wrote it ahead of time. Um, and then he went to work for, for this guy, uh, Fiorello LaGuardia. Now, when he went to work for LaGuardia as an aide, uh, LaGuardia was a uh, congressman, and he was a, a, a liberal, anti-prohibition uh, anti congressman uh, representing uh, New York City. And of course, shortly after uh, Cuneo joined him, he became uh, the mayor of, of New York City, when he held that post through most of the 1930s and I think all of, all of World War II. Cuneo did a little bit of everything for, for LaGuardia. Um, you know, he was, uh, you know, was involved in all kinds of different negotiations, uh, kind of had the reputation of a negotiator, or if you want to use maybe a less polite term, a fixer uh, for, for the mayor, and, and got to know LaGuardia quite, quite well. And uh, eventually, uh, his next job then was for the, uh, the Democratic National Committee. 
And at that time, the chairman of the Democratic Party was this guy, uh, James Farley, so he was shaking hands there, of course, with, with FDR. And so uh, he became an assistant counsel uh, to the Democratic National Committee in, in 1936. And uh, one of the first things he was done, it seemed like whenever there was some kind of difficult negotiation or something, uh, they tended to, to send Cuneo, uh, again, kind of working behind the scenes. So in 1937, he went to uh, Flint, Michigan, where the famous uh, GM uh, sit-down strike against General Motors took place. And he was involved with the negotiations uh, with uh, Governor Frank Murphy of, of uh, the governor of Michigan, uh, where they finally, General Motors did recognize and sign a contract with United Auto Workers in 1937. So he was one of the negotiators who was in on that. Um, and then, next photograph I have here is of a, uh, a little down uh, lobby of a, a dining room of a downtown hotel uh, known as the Lafayette Hotel, a small hotel in, in Manhattan. And this was kind of a hangout for a group of, of liberal Democrats who were planning the future. And at that time, of course, nobody had ever run for president more than two times. Uh, even though there was no, at that time, there was no uh, amendment that prohibited you from running another term. Nobody had ever done that. And so they were trying to figure out, well, who in the world are we gonna put up, nominate for president in 1940 uh, when FDR retires as, as we expected? And they said, well, you know, this FDR has dominated the scene so much. If we want you know, a liberal Democrat, who are we gonna find? How are we gonna get some kind of groundswell of, of interest and enthusiasm? And at one of these meetings, Cuneo suggested um, using Walter Winchell. And a guy who was at the meeting, uh, another uh, Tommy, known as Tommy the Cor Corcoran, who uh, was also on the Democratic National Committee and did a lot of behind the scenes political work for, for the White House, said, Winchell, you know, this guy is, he's, he's below the dignity of the White House. And uh, Cuneo, you know, who, uh, Trino was kind of a, had a sense of humor and also was a guy who knew the classics and liked to quote the classics and said that, well, necessity is above even the gods, you know. Um, if anybody can get America's attention, it's, it's Walter Winchell. And at the time, Winchell was very powerful. He had a syndicated column that, uh, you know, if you look at the readership of newspaper, could reach as many as 50 million people in the United States. And he also had a radio broadcast every Sunday night that, that had an audience of about 20 million people. And so uh, he did uh, meet, meet Walter Winchell and uh, found him a very fascinating person, thought that he was, had a very nimble mind, but he also realized that if he wanted to, to get Winchell, so to speak, on the team here, he was going to have to do something for Winchell. Uh, Winchell always needed rumors, well, not just rumors, information. He always wanted to have a scoop. And so he knew he would have to provide some, some of the uh, some information that would get into, into Winchell's columns and, and radio broadcasts. So this began a relationship that was gonna last for, for several years. And by, by 1940, uh, Winchell was paying Cuneo $10,000 a year, which was a lot of money in 1940, uh, officially as, as his legal representative. But in fact, Winchell was doing uh, all kinds of, or Cuneo was doing all kinds of things for Winchell, uh, getting him information, kind of using Winchell as a, as a trial balloon for the Democratic National Committee and later for FDR himself. Um, and Winchell did a lot of, I'm sorry, Cuneo did a lot of ghostwriting for Walter Winchell. Um, as a matter of fact, I want to quote something that, that Winchell said about, about Cuneo's uh, contributions to him over the years. Um, I can't quite talk like Walter Winchell, but <laughs> he would say this much more rapidly than I. Uh, I said, that, that, that Cuneo chap was good at writing punchy, pithy political pattern. He wrote nearly all of my Mr. and Mrs. America's 30-second radiatorials for over 25 years. His Washington stuff embellished many of my broadcasts and columns. Paid from front pages from coast to coast confirmed the exclusives he gave us. Well, what he was using Winchell for at first was to see you know, who could possibly be the head of the ticket in 1940 at a time when FDR was not yet planning to run for president. 
they found out there was really nobody <laughs> that uh, that uh, would, would catch fire. They would mention a name or something on the air and, and, and see what kind of reaction they got from, from Winchell's audience. And, and, and nothing seemed to really, uh, no, no name seemed to catch on. Um, in doing the research, I was kind of surprised to find out that uh, uh, the person that FDR personally was thinking of as, as running in, in 1940 was a guy he had appointed to the Supreme Court, uh, William O. Douglas. Um, again, Supreme Court isn't exactly the platform you expect somebody to run for for president. Um, now, Winchell also introduced Cuneo to one of his good friends, FBI Director Herbert Hoover, seen here with his deputy Clyde Tolson. And uh, this was a photograph taken at the Stork Club. And the Stork Club was a famous New York City hangout at the time. And in fact, uh, Winchell spent almost every night there, except when he was doing his radio broadcast. And he had a certain table that was reserved for him. And uh, Hoover and Winchell may seem like an unlikely pair, but uh, Winchell did a lot of, of good publicity for the FBI portrayed the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover the way he wanted to be portrayed. And they, too, exchanged information. Uh, one of the favors that uh, Hoover did for Winchell was he actually got him an, an appointment uh, to, of all things, a, as a lieutenant in uh, the Naval Intelligence uh, as, as a reserve officer. Uh, and so uh, Winchell and, and Cuneo and, uh, and J. Edgar Hoover had a lot in common. Uh, they believed in the power of secrets. Uh, they liked finding out secrets. Uh, they liked the fact that they had them. And they liked the power of being able to choose when and where and to whom to disclose those secrets. And, and so they, in a lot of ways, they would be partners for, uh, for the next several years. And just a couple other photographs. That was the, uh, the emblem there, the store club, and uh, uh, a shot taken uh, outside. Um, this is an older shot from the 50s of Winchell with a couple starlets, uh, one of whom I'm sure you recognize. And uh, it was kind of one of those places to be seen. As a matter of fact, we have a photograph here of uh, John and Jackie Kennedy taken in the uh, 50s when he was a, a senator at the store club, and also uh, Ronald Reagan and, and his wife, Nancy. And um, in 1938, FDR attempted and I say attempted, it didn't really work out too well, kind of a purge of the more conservative anti-New Deal Democrats from Congress. And it, it basically backfired. And at that point, the liberal wing of the party was, was coming to the conclusion that the only person who could get the nomination and have a shot at winning the presidency in 1940 was, in fact, FDR himself. And so it became... Uh, the job of, of Winchell with Cuneo operating behind the scenes to kind of figure out who might want to run against FDR for the Democratic nomination in 1940. And again, they had been floating names before, and now they did it with a, uh, shall we say, a little bit more uh, negative intent, is to figure out you know, who was actually interested in the nomination so they could kind of knock them down. And, and so, uh, that was their kind of behind the scenes thing they were doing in 1938, 1939, going into early 1940 before the, uh, the Democratic Convention. And uh, this is the, the uh, apartment building that uh, Cuneo lived in in Washington, D.C. Uh, through most of the time period we're talking about here. And it's in uh, kind of Embassy Row, kind of uh, near, near like Massachusetts Avenue and Connecticut Avenue where a lot of the uh, the foreign embassies are located. Columbia University was a very important connection for, for Cuneo. A lot of people that later played a big role, uh, either inside or outside FDR's administration, were people who'd actually been former professors of Cuneo when he was at Columbia. Uh, one of them was this guy, Adolph Burl, who was uh, an advisor during the 1932 campaign. Uh, kind of an expert on corporate law, and then in 1938, he was appointed by FDR as the Assistant Secretary of State for Latin American Affairs. And one of Burl's jobs, uh, definitely an unenviable job, was 
At that time, there was no intel American intelligence agency. We, we had no single agency in charge of finding out what you know, foreign countries were up to, militarily or, or any otherwise. Um, and so there was a, a constant turf war going on during this time period. Uh, people in the State, Part State Department thought you know, they should be the, the source of what's happening uh, to the president and the outside world. Uh, the Office of Naval Intelligence had their own kind of bailiwick that they, that they guarded very jealously. And then there was uh, uh, the Military Intelligence Division from the Army. By the way, this is a time when the Army and Navy uh, still had separate cabinet positions. You know, there was no defense, unified Defense Department. Uh, but the guy who really was the most aggressive in this turf war, uh, be no surprise to find out, was the head of the FBI, uh, J. Edgar Hoover. Now, the FBI was also in charge of finding you know, foreign spies in America. You know, that, that was the, the part of their role as domestic security. And actually, they had not been doing that great a job of it. There were a couple very embarrassing uh, incidents that happened in the 1930s. Um, for example, uh, some German spies got away with the plans for the Norden bomb site. And then uh, a guy, um, he was a, uh, actually uh, quit the FBI and then wrote a book about it, <laughs> uh, about this kind of embarrassing failure. Um, but J. Edgar Hoover wanted to become the head of the intelligence agency, both uh, going after domestic spies and also internationally being the spy agency for the United States. Uh, another key person was, I mentioned William O. Douglas. He was also a guy who was a, uh, a, law, a law professor uh, that uh, Cuneo studied under at, uh, at Columbia. And again, on the Supreme Court at this time, and at one point, FDR was kind of his favorite candidate to get the Democratic nomination in 1940 if he did himself. And then this character, uh, Drew Pearson. Uh, Drew Pearson uh, became a, a muckraking Washington, D.C. columnist. And he and a partner wrote a book in 1932 called The Washington Merry-Go-Round that exposed a lot of scandals going on behind the scenes in Washington. And it was so successful that he had a regular column well into the 1960s called The Washington Merry-Go-Round. And he was another one who seemed to get, uh, get dig out information and, and dirt that nobody else could. So. Uh, all very connected people. Now, in 1940, Roosevelt had a very surprising opponent, uh, this guy, Wendell Wilkie. And that's a whole other story in itself, that uh, most of the Republican Party was isolationist. Uh, most of them were behind Robert Taft of Ohio. And yet, somehow, kind of the international wing of the Republican Party was able to, to organize uh, uh, kind of a surprise candidacy at the 1940 Republican Convention and promote Wendell Wilkie, who was a businessman from Indiana uh, with no political experience, but he was an internationalist. Uh, and of course, that was a big factor going into, obviously, World War II has now started. Hitler invaded Poland in September 1939, so by the summer of 1940, uh, Hitler had already uh, forced the surrender of France. And uh, of course, probably the most famous slogan in Wilkie's campaign against FDR was, was this button, you know, out stealing third. Uh, that no, no third term had ever, no president had ever run for a third term before. Uh, but in my research, I have to say my all time favorite campaign button, I almost couldn't believe this was a real one, <laughs> but it was out there in 1940, was this one. No man is good three times. <laughs> So, uh, so anyway, a couple of campaign buttons here for Roosevelt and, and Wallace. Wallace was put on the ticket uh, third term. Uh, John Nance Garner was not interested in, in running. And um, Cuneo did such a good job in kind of figuring out you know, what Democrats might want to oppose FDR and getting that nomination for a third term that um, after FDR did win election in 1940, he actually invited Cuneo to sit in the presidential box with him during the inaugural parade. Cuneo, of course, said, no thanks. 
too much too much visibility for him. Uh, so he, he declined that, that honor. And just another campaign button there. Um, and then a couple photographs from the 1940 uh, convention in, I believe, Chicago, where, uh, again, somewhat kind of engineered a groundswell for Roosevelt to get that nomination for, for a third term. And at the time, it's, it's kind of hard for us today to, to, to reflect back on what it was like then. But as far as whether America should get involved in World War II uh, in Europe or in Asia, or whether we should stay isolated and out of it, was, was really quite, quite a bitter political, political argument at the time. And public opinion was, was very divided. And, and you can kind of see that in, in some of the political cartoons. Um, you know, the one on the left is kind of like, you know, these are, these are such idiots here. They get into a big war every 20 years, you know. Let's, let's stay out of it. Um, cartoon, the other cartoon I've got here was actually, you probably recognize the style. Uh, it was done by Dr. Seuss. Uh, again, being kind of ironic here, saying, you know, we've got separate beds, you know, we've got nothing to worry about. Uh, Dr. Seuss was, uh, at, at the time, one of the people who was for uh, intervention in, in the war in Europe. And while all this was going on, Britain realized after France surrendered that it would need help from the United States. Uh, even if it wasn't an actual declaration of war, help in some shape or form, sympathy, aid, whatever. And um, this man came on the scene, uh, William Stevenson. And he was a millionaire Canadian businessman who was hired by the British government to, to come to New York City. And he took over a very innocuous office called British Passport Control. It wasn't British Passport Control. It was, in fact, uh, an arm of MI6, which is the foreign arm of, of British intelligence. And, uh, especially when Churchill became prime minister, right at the time that France was falling, uh, he knew that it was very important to get the United States on, on his side. And so Stevenson was sent to New York, and a, a meeting was set up between Stevenson and J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, oddly enough, by a mutual friend, the former boxer Gene Tunney. And uh, at, the, at the time, we still had the neutrality acts in place. And one of the things it said was, uh, you know, to be truly neutral, you can't cooperate with any intelligence service of a country that's at war. And so there wasn't supposed to be any official contact between British intelligence and, you know, the FBI, American intelligence, or or anything. And in this meeting, um, there's a couple emblems there of uh, uh, their new name they came up with, which, by the way, was suggested by. J. Edgar Hoover, I think he liked the three letter initials. Uh, they changed their name to British Security Coordination, another kind of innocuous sounding name. Uh, that's what British Passport Control became. And, and basically what, what who, the deal they made with Stevenson was that, uh, okay, we will cooperate, okay, with British intelligence under the guise of, of British Security Coordination, but, uh, you know, it has to have the president's approval, and everything has to operate through, no big surprise, J. Edgar Hoover. And so that was the agreement, at least the initial agreement. So what Stevenson did is he moved to uh, move the headquarters to the Rockefeller Center on the 36th floor, rented a big suite, eventually took over more and more, and more territory um, in, in the Rockefeller Center. And, and BSC became a huge organization. Uh, it was estimated at one time they had maybe 2,000 people working for them, not just in the United States, but in, in the Western Hemisphere. And as far as the, the activities that they were involved in, um, again, I wanted to uh, quote here, and this time I want to quote from uh, Ernest Cuneo, because Cuneo eventually uh, worked very closely with Stevenson. Uh, as far as what they did, especially during that time period before uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, and we're talking about a year and a half since Stevenson came to New York in June of 1940 till December 1941. Uh, according to Cuneo, the BSC ran espionage agents, tampered with the mails, tapped telephones, smuggled propaganda into the country, disrupted public gatherings, covertly subsidized newspapers, radios, and organizations, perpetrated forgeries, even palming one off on the President of the United States, violated the agent 
Aliens Registration Act, Shanghai sailors numerous times, and possibly murdered one or two more people in this country. So they were very active, uh, to say the least. And as Trino once put it, you know, if, uh, if their goal was to push America into the war, uh, we were certainly a, a pushover. Um, but he said for the British, of course, it was a life or death matter. Uh, Americans didn't view it the same way. And, and FDR himself always liked to keep a lot of balls in the air juggling them. Um, you know, when you had a meeting with FDR, you always came away, wow, that went great. He agreed with me 100%. And, and then maybe nothing would come of it. Um, and the same thing when it came to the issue of foreign intelligence. So while this turf war is going on between the Army, the Navy, the State Department, and the FBI, um, FDR brings in somebody else. This guy, William J. Donovan, known as Wild Bill Donovan, who had won a Congressional <laughs> Medal of Honor in the First World War. He'd been an assistant attorney general uh, under, under Coolidge. And guess, guess what college Donovan was a graduate of? Columbia. <laughs> um, so he, and he was also a Republican uh, from upstate New York. Well, he called in Donovan and basically sent him on a personal mission uh, to Great Britain, basically to say, are they gonna survive? You know, can the Brits hold out against the Nazis? Are they, are they worth saving? You know, can, we, can we bet on them? Uh, and of course, when Donovan went over there, he was, you know, got the royal treatment, you know, literally met the king, met, met Churchill, uh, met the head of British intelligence, and they did all they could to impress Donovan with the fact that Britain was going to fight, Britain was going to hold out. Uh, so he came back with a very positive message, and now the turf war got more complicated. Um, FDR made him the head of something, he made him what was called the coordinator of intelligence, uh, who was supposed to somehow crowd all these different agencies and, and get them to share information. Um, one of the things he came back with, though, was a desperate need for destroyers. Uh, the, the British had a lot of tonnage being sunk by, by German submarines. And so this led, in August, to the, the famous destroyer deal, where in exchange for some bases uh, in the Western Hemisphere on, on British possessions, the US was going to send uh, 50 uh, older, as we put it, destroyers to, to Great Britain. And Cunio went to the White House uh, the morning that this was going to be announced, and uh, the Attorney General, a guy named Robert Jackson, another friend of his, met with him and said, you know, this, is, this deal, this is awful. Uh, it's unconstitutional. And Cunio said, uh, you better be prepared to accept it, because uh, you're either going to accept it or they'll ask for your resignation by this afternoon, because it, it's a done deal. And of course it was, and of course he didn't resign. So uh, I have a photograph here of the handoff of these fitted the destroyers to, to Great Britain. Um, and not only did the, they get 50 destroyers, but the destroyers were completely, um, completely outfitted with all the ammunition, all kinds of food, just about everything that we could, we could stuff into them to, uh, to help the Brits. Um, why was FDR able to get away with this? Why was he also able to, by a single vote in the House of Representatives, get America's first peacetime draft passed in both in August of 1940? Mainly because his Republican opponent, Wendell Wilkie, did not oppose those two big moves. Again, he was kind of on the, the internationalist side of the Republican Party. And this is the, uh, a shot from the inaugural parade, uh, which of course happened in, in January of 1940 after FDR's election. And, and after Cunio turned him down uh, with the offer to sit in the, uh, the presidential uh, box with him to, to view the parade. And as, uh, as Cunio put it, that uh, once FDR got reelected, uh, he kind of strapped on his helmet and went in, or at least went in as far as public opinion uh, would allow him to go in to, to help, help Britain. And so not long after that, uh, the Lend-Lease deal was proposed. And uh, not an easy thing to maneuver through Congress, but eventually it, it did get through. And that led to sending literally billions of dollars worth of military equipment to anybody who was fighting the, the, the fascist power. So primarily Britain, but also uh, at that time, uh, the Soviet Union and, and China and uh, just a photograph there of one of the, I think it was called a Grant tank, 
one of our early tanks being loaded onto a ship to be sent off to, uh, to Britain. And um, at this time, uh, William Donovan got a promotion. He was, he was given the rank of, of general, and instead of being the coordinator of information, he became the head of the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services. And uh, they were going to provide uh, intelligence for the military, and then also eventually, once we got into the war, um, you know, covert operations uh, behind, behind enemy lines. Now, at first, um, this guy, FDR's oldest son, James, was given the job of, of being the, the person who was going to um, be the communicator, kind of the go-between, the conduit between this new agency, uh, the OSS, uh, William Donovan, and all the other federal agencies. And that's the job he performed until Pearl Harbor. Uh, right after Pearl Harbor, uh, James went to his father and said, you know, I, I want to act, I want to uh, volunteer for the active military. And so he resigned his position as this behind the scenes coordinator and, and actually went into the active duty with the Marines. So Donovan got to name his successor and he named Ernest Cuneo. Now again, a fellow uh, Columbian grad. So during, during the war years, Cuneo was the go between, between the British security coordination uh, the White House, uh, the FBI, and, uh, and any other federal agencies. And there were certain people that he reported to. And as he reported, uh, almost never did anything in writing. You know, almost everything was done verbally so there wouldn't be any kind of record that would have to be, uh, have to be torn up later. And so, uh, again, it was the, the attack on Pearl Harbor that, that put Cuneo in that position. Uh, also, there's a number, there's, there's a lot of, uh, uh, should I put it? misinformation out there. <laughs> there is a famous book written about William Stevenson uh, called A Man Called Intrepid, uh, and that was Stevenson's code name. And it was in fact Stevenson who gave Cuneo the code name of Crusader. Uh, and uh, in that book it said that Cuneo was involved at a much earlier date, but in fact he only went into that position uh, after, after Pearl Harbor. Now, at the same time, he is still working with Walter Winchell. And, and Winchell also got fed a lot of information. Um, at this point, not just as trial balloons, but um, you know, unofficial leaks from the government. There were certain things that Winchell mentioned in broadcasts and columns uh, that were basically leaked to him on purpose by, by Ernest Cuneo. And again, but he was saying he was kind of being a mouthpiece for, for the White House. And of course, that's uh, FDR making the uh, uh, you know, announcement the day after, after Pearl Harbor. And of course, uh, I always mention to my students, you know, I ask them, well, when's the last time Congress ever declared war? And the fact is, um, it was 19, December 1941. Uh, the day after Pearl Harbor, we declared war on Japan, and then when Hitler was unwise enough three days later to declare war on us. We declared war on, on Germany and Italy, and Congress has not voted to declare war ever since. Um, so, so Cuneo was in, in quite a position of, uh, of, of knowing a lot of different things and being a, a go-between and a key liaison, liaison. Now, one of the problems that developed was Stevenson and J. Edgar Hoover were both kind of empire builders. And Hoover very quickly became very jealous of Donovan and the OSS. Uh, because even though in, in June of 1940, he expanded the scope of FD, F, the FBI's uh, intelligence uh, operations to include the Western Hemisphere. So there were FBI agents throughout Central America and, and Latin America. And Hoover was hoping that was the first step to making the FBI America's intelligence agency. And so he saw the OSS as a rival. And not just a rival, but also a British rival. Uh, he saw the OSS and BSC and William Stevenson being very cozy, very chummy. And so they had cooperated very well in the early stages of the war. In fact, a lot of the Nazi spies that were rounded up in America uh, before uh, Pearl Harbor uh, were actually thanks to British intelligence. 
uh, they had a massive letter, if you will, mail opening operation in Bermuda, uh, mostly mostly done by uh, by women, by the way, opening all kinds of uh, communications going across the Atlantic. And that led to the capture of quite a number of, of Nazi spies, in fact, the majority of Nazi spies in the US before uh, we were actually at war with Germany. Uh, the next two people are two of the people Cuneo mentions as contacts. The guy on the left was David Niles, who worked in the White House, and the guy on the right was Ed Pam, who was uh, an assistant director of the FBI. And these are the people he usually communicated with in coordinating things between all these, these different agencies. Um, Ed Pam became a good friend of his uh, you know, throughout the rest of his life, he later became a federal judge. Um, and it's kind of interesting just how many paths uh, crossed with that of Cuneo's. Uh, Cuneo also got to know this guy. I don't know if anybody recognizes who he is, but that's, uh, that's Ian Fleming. Uh, Ian Fleming was a lieutenant in uh, naval and British naval intelligence. And during uh, a lot of the early war years, he was posted to, to New York City and was often in contact with William Stevenson and, and British security coordination. And they actually became uh, lifelong friends uh, during this, this time period. Uh, maybe even more important person that Cuneo met during this time was this woman, uh, Margaret Watson. Uh, Margaret Watson, who became Cuneo's wife, uh, was from Winnipeg, Canada. She was one of the many women that William Stevenson brought to New York City uh, to work with the British security coordination and he met her there and they became friends. And in fact, this is a photograph taken at the, uh, the Stork Club. Churchill was getting a little bit nervous um, as the 1944 election came up and uh, uh, Thomas Dewey of New York was going to be running against, uh, against FDR. And, and Churchill, you know, earlier Churchill, had, earlier, um, FDR had wanted to know if Churchill and the British were going to survive uh, the Nazi onslaught in the Battle of Britain. And now Churchill got a little bit nervous about is FDR going to survive the November 1944 election when he went for an unprecedented fourth term. And so he asked uh, William Stevenson at the BSC to see if they could find out. He was worried because a Gallup poll, uh, I think in September 1944, showed that FDR was actually behind, uh, that there was a good chance he might lose that. And so Stevenson, you know, he said, I, I don't really have anybody who's an expert on American politics. So he talked to Cuneo, and Cuneo hooked him up with a, uh, a statistician who worked for the OSS. And he did his own poll predicting the 1944 election. And he came back very confidently. He said, FDR has got 32 states sewn up. There's maybe eight more states that, that he could possibly win. And that prediction was actually much more accurate than the Gallup polls. Uh, FDR ended up winning 36 states, the 32 that the statistician had said he was going to win, and he won exactly half the states that he predicted he could probably win. A um, couple other people that uh, were key, uh, key people for uh, Walter Winchell, and then also kind of indirectly for, for Cunha were these two guys. The guy on the left was uh, Arnold Forster, and he was the head of the Jewish Anti-Defamation League. And he was another person who had his ear to the ground and had a lot of contacts both in the United States and around the world. And there were several times where he alerted the FBI to people who had some uh, virulently uh, anti-Semitic things that they were saying, maybe in private and that. Uh, and actually, a couple German spies were, were nabbed through, through his information. Uh, the guy on the right was the other key ghostwriter for Walter Winchell besides Cunio. Cunio kind of took care of things like defense matters, foreign affairs, uh, anything to deal with the military. Uh, this guy, er Ernest uh, uh, Clearfeld, uh, was more on the, shall we say, the lighter side, more of the show business side, and wrote just kind of the, the pithy uh, quips and things for, for Winchell. And, uh, Probably one of the favorite ones that I recall that, that Winchell really liked that Clerkfeld had surprised, supplied him with was I guess he was uh, trying to come up to, with a way to describe a, a, a Hollywood starlet 
who had been around the blocks a few times. And so uh, the, the line Clearfeld came up with was, she sat on more laps than an Afghan. And kind uh, of gives you the idea of uh, Walter Winchell style. Um, everybody had to deal with censorship during, during the war. And uh, one, one of the censors actually complained about Walter Winchell is that they had to treat him with kid gloves because they knew that he was the, the beneficiary of some leaks from the White House. And as he put it, I think he's considered a little tin god by the Army and the Navy. Um, but Drew Pearson um, was the, the journalist who was always seeming to get scoops that, um, that, the, that the censors didn't necessarily want to go out there. And so if you had, there were ways around it. You had to kind of write that something was speculation or uh, you know, if it was anything that pertained to the military, you had to name a source and, and therefore they could either get the source in trouble for, for leaking it or more easily know that, well, this is baloney or that this is legitimate. Um, well, at one time, uh, Pearson was the, uh, the subject of uh, uh, what he considered an insult from FDR. He had written a couple of critical articles about Cordell Hall after an assistant secretary of the state had been fired and, and uh, Roosevelt referred to him as a chronic liar. And so um, Drew Pearson came to his friend, Ernest Cunio, and said, I need something. I, I need something that I could put in a radio broadcast or in a newspaper article that will make everybody forget about what FDR said. And Cunio said, oh, I've got something for you. It was a story about George Patton. Um, in Sicily, George Patton had, actually this happened on two different occasions, had slapped uh, wounded soldiers uh, who he thought were malingerers who were just kind of avoiding, avoiding combat. And actually, this was widely known about war, you know, several war correspondents were, were quite you know, well aware of it. But they had gotten together and decided, okay, we're, we're going to suppress this story, we're just going to let you know, we're gonna let Patton's boss Eisenhower deal with it. Um, so Cuneo gave the leak to Drew Pearson. And so in his radio broadcast in November of, of 1943, um, Drew Pearson broke the story about this slapping of, of wounded soldiers by, uh, by George Patton. And of course, that was a huge controversy. Um, it, was, it was a huge controversy because he did it, and it was a huge controversy that the news had leaked out, and, and people were very uh, angry and divided about that. But Drew Pearson did kind of pay back Cunio for, for, that, uh, for, that, for that doing him that favor, and that was suppressing a story that could have been very embarrassing to Cunio. Um, Cunio did speak Italian. I should have mentioned his parents were Italian immigrants, and so he, he did a lot of dealings with uh, agents from, from Italy. And at one time, he was on a, uh, anyway, he was uh, riding a train between uh, Washington and New York, and he was sitting and talking with uh, an agent from, from Italy. And uh, he was in a, a, a converted uh, mail car that you know, during the war, during the crush of, of needing a lot of uh, passenger cars, uh, had been converted into a, a passenger car. And a guy who I guess was just a hobbyist or something, a rail fan or whatnot, snapped a photograph of Cuneo figured him and this agent. And then the guy exchanged a, a, a Time magazine with somebody, and Cuneo thought that there was a handoff going on, that maybe this agent had been compromised. So, so Cuneo was very upset, so he went through the train, he found a lieutenant and a, a private uh, who were MPs. And uh, you know, he, they, they, he picked out the guy that had picked up the, the, uh, the magazine that he thought had gotten this photograph handed off to them, uh, or the final film handed off to him. And they followed him to a restroom on the train. And when Cunio knocked on the door, the, he was in a stall. The guy wouldn't open. And he told the private with him, well, shoot off the lock. <laughs> and the guy said, I'm not going to do that in the train. What are you doing? And he wouldn't, he wouldn't do it. So uh, what happened was, uh, when the train pulled into to Penn Station in New York, uh, Cuneo actually had the whole train detained and interviewed by the FBI. There were like 700 people on the train. And the guy who took the photograph threatened to, uh, to sue Cuneo. Uh, he didn't, but 
you know, Drew Pearson, you know, dialed him up in the middle of the night and said that, you know, Hoover had told him this story, you know, and, and he said, it's safe with me, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to leak it out, but he, he kind of had a big laugh over it. Although, why do I know it? Well, Drew Pearson did put it in his diary that got published, so. Um, so Premier was, was quite zealous. But when it came to secrets, a lot of secrets were, were being kept, and you've probably heard that when uh, Truman was put on the ticket with FDR, he really only had a couple meetings with FDR, and this was one of them that they, they filmed, and Truman was uh, appalled afterwards about how shaky FDR's hand was with trying to handle the, the teacups. Uh, among things that Truman was not told was about the Manhattan Project. Uh, there were all kinds of secrets that were, that were kept from, from Truman. And I think when he became president, he, he may have resented that a little bit. Um, you know, this is one of the last photographs taken of FDR, and that's because um, all these arrangements that, that we're discussing here, uh, they disappeared rather quickly after FDR died. Um, there weren't any big personnel changes made until after uh, v, uh, VE Day, the Victory in, in Europe Day, in May 8th. But as soon as, as, as after that date, Truman started uh, letting people go and, and bringing in his own people. And one of the biggest targets was the OSS. Um, you know, Hoover resented the, the OSS. Um, a lot of people who thought that we were too beholden to the British resented the OSS. And this is uh, William Donovan uh, pinning a medal on the, uh, the chest of, of William Stevenson, the head of British security coordination. A lot of people thought the OSS was too much of a junior partner uh, to, to the Brits, that they were kind of the creation of the BSC and that they were kind of giving the, the British line, so to speak. And so the OSS was disbanded three weeks after Japan surrendered. September 20th, you know, Donovan was given his walking papers. The OSS was disbanded real quickly. And Truman also moved against the power of, of Drew Pearson and, and Walter Winchell. You know, he knew that especially you know, Winchell had, had gotten a lot of uh, intentional leaks and that you know, Pearson had a lot of sources in the FDR administration. And so uh, around this time, he said that uh, you know, Pearson and, and Winchell are too big for the bridges. You know, uh, we gotta figure out who's running this country, me or them. And it's better to have this, uh, this fight now than later. And so even though they remain influential columnists for years, uh, their connection to the White House was, was basically cut off, uh, as was Cuneo's. Um, and Cuneo remained a, um, a Democratic operative. He had a lot of friends in that, but he certainly did not have anything like the same kind of connection with the uh, uh, Truman administration that he had with, with FDRs. And this is another picture at the Stork Club. Uh, where a lot of Democratic operatives there. On the left, of course, is, is Cuneo. Right next to him is Walter Winchell. The guy in the very middle uh, was Edwin Pauley, who was the head of the Democratic Party at that time. Robert Hennigan is the second from the right. He had an important position in, in Truman's administration. But uh, this was kind of like the, the last hurrah as far as his connection to, to the folks in, in power. So, uh, and also his, his connection with Walter Winchell kind of gradually fell away over the years. And so for the most part, you know, Truman, uh, Truman, uh, Cuneo went, went back to being a, a, a full-time lawyer, um, although he kind of kept his hand, as we'll mention later, in, uh, in the world of journalism, kind of went back into journalism. He also stayed close friends with um, Ian Fleming, who had a place in, in Jamaica uh, the other guy here in the photo is a guy named Ivar Bryce, who is also uh, connected to British security coordination. And, and Bryce became one of the partners, along with Cuneo, is they bought a chain of newspapers um, known as the North American Newspaper Alliance. And in the 50s and early 60s, they had a very, uh, very conservative, I guess you could say kind of a Cold War, Cold War warrior type uh, editorial stance. And of course, uh, you know, once the OSS was kind of resurrected as the CIA, um, obviously you know, Cuneo still had some contacts, uh, contacts in the intelligence world. And then of course, during the, the 1950s, uh, Ian Fleming became famous as the inventor of the James, James Bond novels. And as a matter of fact, his fourth novel 
called Diamonds Are Forever. Um, he came to America in 1954, and he and Cuneo spent almost the entire summer of 1954 together. They did a road trip across the U.S., starting from the East Coast, went to the, the West Coast, spent time in places like Saratoga Springs and Las Vegas, and uh, Fleming was doing research for this uh, novel, uh, Diamonds Are Forever. And as a matter of fact, you could say there's a, a kind of alter ego of Cuneo in the novel. Uh, when James Bond gets to Las Vegas, he has a, a, a loyal cab driver named Ernest Curio, who gets beaten up badly at one point, but he, he survives. Uh, and by the way, if you've ever seen the film Diamonds Are Forever, the final scene is totally different from the book. <laughs> Uh, in the book, the final scene is, is uh, played out in a, uh, uh, a ghost town out west, and not an oil rig. Um, Cuneo also, like I said, was a lifelong friend of Fleming's, and he contributed uh, a lot of ideas, apparently, to uh, a couple later novels of, uh, of Fleming. Uh, Thunderball, this is, of course, one of the, the movie posters. And as a matter of fact, the dedication to Thunderball is to Ernest Cuneo. It's to Ernest Cuneo, comma, muse. Um, so supposedly the basic plot ideas of Thunderball were Cuneo's ideas, and he also contributed some of the plot twists to uh, what became Goldfinger. Um, Cuneo himself also did some writing uh, during this time period. He wrote a book called Life with Fiorello, uh, where he told a lot of the behind the scenes stories of, of uh, Fiorello just as uh, how he was both in, in Congress and as a mayor and, and different things that, uh, but again, he, he does not highlight what he does. <laughs> you, you don't get a real good idea from reading this what exactly Cuneo did for, uh, for LaGuardia, but you certainly get an idea of LaGuardia's colorful personality. There's a lot of interesting stories in it. And uh, not that it was a big hit, but they actually made a musical <laughs> based on uh, Cuneo's account of Fiorello, known as Fiorello, the, the musical, uh, which, uh, and it has actually gotten revived a couple times, so it wasn't like, uh, it wasn't like a one and done. Um, Cuneo also wrote this book called uh, A Science in History, where he kind of has a, a, a big picture uh, look at, uh, at the world and his theories of, of how science and history kind of work out uh, from, but again, uh, not not so much telling inside stories that he did is kind of looking at looking very general, um, and like I said, he maintained his contacts. This is a, a photograph of him, the second from the right here, at, a, at an auction of a of a uh, uh, antique uh, a rifle, and and then for a number of years he wrote a, a syndicated column called uh, Take It or Leave It, and that was his photograph as it appeared in a number of newspapers. And he mostly wrote about foreign affairs, uh, defense matters, and again, from a pretty conservative point of view, this is at the time of, of uh, say, Vietnam and, and even into the early 70s. And for a time, he also edited uh, the Saturday Evening Post during the same time period, obviously when it was not as, as popular a, uh, or as big a circulation as it was in its, in its earlier years. Um, and then a photograph of him uh, taken at somebody who's getting a, uh, a journalism award. And, and then the last photograph I have of him at, uh, at, a, at a banquet. Um, Cuneo died in 1988, and uh, his friends were actually hoping to get him, um, get a, the, uh, the Presidential Medal of Freedom for him. They actually campaigned for that. Uh, but instead, what they got was this honor. Uh, his ashes were buried at Arlington, and he was put to rest by uh, what were known as the Marine Body Bearers. And oddly enough, somehow in the 1950s, he had secured a commission as a reserve officer in the U.S. Marines uh, when he was in his 50s, although he never served a day of, of active duty. But, but knowing Cuneo, he probably liked the, uh, the low-key ceremony at Arlington better than, than, than any other particular honor. That's our story. Wow, Mike, that was amazing. History we didn't know.